administration in Lansing and in the nation and at Wayne State. We have uh, actions uh, taken by lame duck by the lame duck session in Lansing, and it's going to affect us greatly, and particularly going to affect uh, if all of the proposals go through. It's going to uh, attempt to cripple the union, but it also is going to deeply cripple the uh, operation of the College of Education and of the, uh, the universities. And so we really are lucky to have, uh, have uh, uh, Ben Pogodinsky from the, uh, what again, Pogodinsky, is that right? Pogodinsky, I'm yeah. close. Ben, close. He's coming, Ben. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, um, to, to be here to talk to us about the, uh, the education implications uh, that are really disastrous. And the uh, uh, and we have Julie Rowe here. Where are you, Julie? Is she outside talking to somebody. <laughs> Julie Rowe, who is a superstar. She was uh, she is our legislative liaison at the state AFT, and she was on loan to run the uh, the coordinated campaign for the Democratic Party uh, in the last uh, in the last uh, election. As you can see, it turned out pretty well. So, uh, without further ado, why don't the, you don't want to hear any more from me? By the way, uh, you will hear some more from me about our, about uh, uh, about in one form or another about our lame duck board of governors who have taken an action that I think was uh, their most unwise two actions. But it, without further ado, I think Ben, why don't you just come up and you take over? Wait, wait a moment. Dan. Yeah. Oh, Dan? Quick update. Okay. Dan is our, is the, uh, Dan Galadner is the head of our PAC. I just wanted to give you a quick overview of what your PAC has done, uh, and then we can get into the discussion about Lame Duck. Um, since uh, we started PAC up again uh, in August, we raised just over $4,000. Um, I think that's a great start, and I applaud all of you have, who have donated um, to the PAC fund. Uh, obviously, the results are something that we're very proud of. But again, the PAC will continue being do, uh, growing on that aspect of ask, asking for more money to continue the battles that we're facing. Also, this uh, fall, we roughly estimated that we knock on about 8,000 doors. We made numerous phone calls, we sent tons of emails, we sent hundreds of texts, and a lot of people, you know, responding very well. Of course, we got the no's, which we'll always expect when you do this kind of thing. But that one person we talked to who said yes, went and talked to their family, we went and talked to their friends, we talked to their neighbors, and we eventually had a nice blue wave in Michigan. Um, before um, most of the things were really starting, the Democratic Party and other things started focusing on the different districts throughout this area that they wanted to flip. We as a PAC looked at that and where our members were, and so I'm proud to say that those districts that we focused on and helped out on flipped. So I like to say that Wayne State University, AUPAFT 6075, did Yeoman's work on this whole uh, fall election stuff. Don't stop. We are not going to stop, exactly as Charlie says, because PAC is going to be here and continue on. We don't show up every two years. PAC is going to be here working on the administration that will be coming in shortly, helping with the past budgets, helping to get laws passed, helping to get various things done, because we don't have the legislator, but we do have a governor. We have a secretary of state. We have an attorney general. And those we're going to help. And we're going to help the people that we helped get elected as well, because they remember us. We're going to help them remember us as well. So just a quick update on that now to um, Michelle Fecto who's going to talk about a little bit of what lame duck means to us, and then we'll get into Ben and, and Julie. Okay. It's just to be really quick. Um, I am assuming most people know what lame duck is. It's the period of um, time after the election and before the new legislators take office. The old legislators who are overwhelmingly um, Republican um, and want to just get their last digs in uh, before they leave for various reasons. But um, I'm told there's over 200 bills that are flying right now uh, around in Lansing. It's like it's a hyper uh, active <laughs> uh, lame duck right now. 
uh, for a variety of reasons. So, but we're we're looking at certain ones. There's, there, of course, we care about the minimum wage and the and leave. And I'm personally going to work on getting the signature signed up for the to get it on the ballot again. I've committed to that. But we're going to focus on bills that uh, affect education and affect unions. Um, so, uh, and we have two wonderful people that um, Charlie mentioned. I just want to give a little bit more background, um, and I'm going to ask Ben to come up, and then Julie. So Ben. Um, Pogodzinski is an associate professor of educational leadership and policy studies at Wayne State University. Prior to his appointment at WSU, he served as an IES postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Virginia's Curry School of Education. His research interests focus on how state and district policies, school organizational context, labor relations, uh, influence teachers, instructional practices, effectiveness, and labor market decisions. His additional research interests focus on school choice policies, school financing, and school financing. His work has <coughs> appeared in Educational Researcher, Educational Administrative Quarterly Journal of Educational Education Policy, Educational Policy American Policy, American Journal of Education, Journal of School Leadership, and Elementary School Journal, among others. So he's very well researched, and I'm very glad to have him. And uh, I'll introduce Julie after you're done. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Very, uh, my pleasure to be here. Um, not then the second string, but uh, kind of channeling my inner Kate Roberts, who is in our teacher ed, uh, teacher preparation program. So she provided a lot of notes. Uh, she's been heavily involved in this as well. Uh, but I'm going to speak on the proposed uh, requirements for teacher preparation institutions, which greatly impacts our college and university, um, as well as colleges and universities across the state. So one of the uh, implied issues, really that teachers are not adequately prepared through traditional routes of preparation, dealing specifically with content, uh, field experience, uh, really targeting the expertise of faculty, so really uh, questioning whether or not uh, our teacher preparation institutions are um, qualified uh, to uh, provide teachers for our state, and then adequate supervision while they're in the field. So these are kind of the broad issues and the assumptions that I see underlying these bills, really an attack on traditional teacher preparation. So why does this matter for, for us? Uh, one, it will greatly increase costs to colleges of education, uh, which will likely increase the cost to our students. Although there are uh, specifications in some of the bills about uh, ensuring that tuition isn't increased. There's always a, a kind of a passing down the bill, so to speak. Uh, but there is some indication that uh, due to these increased costs, some colleges of education, or at least teacher preparation programs, would cease to exist. They simply do not have the resources to cover the costs which would be put on them uh, if some of these bills were to pass. And it's certainly not clear that there's any evidence that this will actually lead to improvements in teacher effectiveness. We all care about the quality of our teachers. We all want effective teachers. Uh, but these bills are, are really uh, misguided in a lot of ways and do not actually connect to the intended outcomes. So from my perspective, that's why it matters. So we'll get into um, the actual uh, set of bills. Uh, one deals specifically with continued education for faculty, so broadly this would require 30 hours per year of continuing education uh, professional development for full-time uh, faculty members in teacher preparation programs, uh, and require a, across a range of subjects and competencies and require uh, experience actually teaching within our K-12 system every year. Uh, there's some odd things in there that this would have to be done both in a rural education setting and an urban education setting, uh, dealing with high uh, proportions of low income students. So one thing that comes to mind is what does this mean for a teacher preparation institution like Wayne State, where our faculty members would have to go out to a rural district somewhere and teach some classes. Or for someone who's in UP, how far would they have to drive to find an urban uh, teaching experience to to uh, get these started <coughs> out. Again, the, the underlying assumptions that there's a disconnect between our faculty members and the field. 
um, it would be a, a logistical nightmare, uh, increased costs, and really detract from what uh, we expect our faculty members to be concentrating on the research and productivity linked to preparing teachers for uh, a successful career. One of the more controversial uh, bills has to deal with a warranty program where the teacher preparation institutions would essentially have to provide a warranty that their graduates uh, are, uh, will be successful as teachers. If a teacher, a new teacher is found to be ineffective within their first two years, they can go back to any other uh, institution to receive professional development or remedial work, and the program from which they receive their teacher certification would have to pay that bill. So uh, this is highly problematic for numerous reasons. One is the non-random distribution of teachers. Our graduates primarily work within Detroit and the surrounding areas where we know that uh, there's low student achievement, so teacher evaluations are largely based on student achievement. Um, therefore, they're more likely to be in a circumstance where they may be deemed uh, ineffective simply because of the very messy link between what teachers do and student productivity. Uh, so that causal link and kind of a research term is really, really fuzzy. We also know that teachers are least effective in their first three years, and they receive extra support from the school districts themselves, mentoring, induction, and there's that, a law that states that school districts must support new teachers because they know they're least effective in that time point. And now they're shifting all of this to teacher preparation programs, which is likely going to cause all sorts of uh, uh, shenanigans and uh, setting of unrealistic higher bars to entry and therefore make the uh, teacher pipeline problem uh, even more problematic. Uh, again, the unknown costs and logistics of all this would be a, a nightmare. Uh, another bill uh, has to do with a stipend for supervisory teachers. Uh, most of us agree that supervisory teachers uh, should be compensated. Uh, the law would require that the teacher preparation programs pay each of their cooperating teachers in a K-12 school $1,000. Uh, according to Kate, uh, right now we have over 260 teachers placed in, two, in our school districts. So you can do the math. Uh, we don't have that kind of money. Yeah. It's a great idea. College of Education do not have the money to pay each supervisor teacher uh, $1,000. So uh, although we can be supportive of the concept, where is the money com coming from? And we certainly do not want to detract or take more money out of our, our K-12 system uh, for Pupil Foundation as well. So they keep rolling here. <laughs> uh, House Bill 5601, uh, we require 400 hours of classroom practicum experience uh, for our teacher candidates uh, across a range of experiences again so that, that rural, urban circumstance is, is really problematic. Our mission here in the College of Education is to prepare effective urban educators. So requiring these arbitrary experiences, for example, in the rural <coughs> setting, does not make sense for our students. Uh, already, the Michigan Department of Education is looking at a 300-hour model before student teaching and 300 hours within student teaching. So this bill makes no sense, uh, and there's a disconnect between what our government is <coughs> already doing and what this bill is proposing to do. So it's, it's really uh, kind of a left field and not aligned with uh, professional norms. Um, and again, has the potential to arbitrarily increase uh, cost and time to completion. 5602 is calling for the creation of an innovative educator uh, core program where they would recruit up to 100 innovative educators, which is pretty uh, loosely defined. Again, at uh, surface level, this is not a, a bad idea to identify and reward or compensate effective educators in our state. Uh, but it's not clear where this money is coming from. Is this the best use of our resources? And how do we ensure that these innovative educators are effective in supporting the schools most in need? There's a big difference between those who are successful teachers and translating that into being supportive uh, mentors and working with schools to improve. Um, 
again, there was some money set aside, but is that just going to take out of the school aid fund and then further uh, detract from money that could be going to low-income students, as an example? Uh, so great concept, lacking details in ensuring that this would be effective use of our resources. Uh, 5603 is dealing with additional reading instruction and really prescribing the types of reading instruction that must be taught in teacher preparation programs. <coughs> um, it would require 12 credits for early elementary, 9 for upper elementary, and 3 for secondary. Uh, in conversation with Kate Roberts, again, we already do this and beyond here in the College of Education, so this would not greatly impact us in terms of credit hours. It would at other teacher preparation institutions. Uh, but her uh, concern largely deals with what it would prescribe uh, in terms of instruction and being out of step with what research um, has stated. So this is right from, from Kate's notes. I mean, you can read. Um, we already meet these credits. The research that this bill is based on is shaky at best and dated, uh, in her opinion. Um, we already have new standards that have been fully vetted, and this is a going a step backwards. So really, again, this disconnect between what this legislation is proposing to do and where we're already at in terms of uh, improvement and driving better teacher effectiveness. Five six zero four uh, prescribes certain teaching uh, requirements for our student teachers. Again, we see this rural and urban uh, language in there, which is problematic since our mission is specific to urban education, uh, and it requires that teacher preparation institutions partner uh, go into partnering agreements with any district where their students are placed. So again, this is a, a very heavy logistical uh, lift. Um, and will require a lot of resources, not just from the College of Education, but those receiving institutions as well. So the K-12 systems, uh, we would have to have an agreement with each of those. So there's a lot of logistical concerns, although this is theoretically uh, achievable. Again, we don't think it's a good use of our time and resources, nor a good use of the school districts which we're serving their time and resources. And what would this look like, again, for Wayne State to partner with a rural district, however that's defined, or a Lake Superior State partnering with an urban uh, school district and entering in a partnership agreement where our students might have to travel one, two, hour and a half away. Uh, that's just not uh, what we're about. Uh, and then 5605 has to do specifically with coursework for teacher prep programs. Again, this is just completely disconnected from what we already do uh, and are required to do by state law in our accrediting body. Uh, so it's redundant and a legislative overreach. Uh, we don't feel it's appropriate that our state legislature uh, should be dictating the specifics about what uh, is involved in a coursework for teacher preparation. Uh, it really hinders the ability to uh, utilize research to continuously improve our programs uh, based on what um, the most recent uh, research suggests is effective. Uh, again, it's, it's redundant from what's already required and would detract from that kind of continuous improvement model. So a, a broad, uh, high-level view of the key takeaways, at least from my perspective, right, going back to increased costs for uh, traditional or for teacher preparation programs. Could all programs survive? Not likely. Smaller programs would not be able to foot the bill. I'm not sure our program would be able to. Uh, if you're spending $1,000 per uh, cooperating teacher or supervisory teacher year over year, what does that do to a budget? On top of all the administrative costs, deal with the logistics, the increased cost in time of completion for students uh, is a great unknown, particularly for students <coughs> such as the ones that we have here at Wayne State, uh, who are often considered non-traditional, uh, so they are not working uh, or going to school full time. So it really increases that time to completion and increased costs. 
and we have a great uh, problem here within the city and even uh, some of the suburbs with a teacher shortage. So anything that's going to uh, impact the, the teacher pipeline not only impacts our, our college here at Wayne State, but impacts our, our school districts. So we think this is very uh, problematic. Um, and I'm a policy guy, so I kind of think about this. <laughs> the response from teacher preparation programs is going to be likely surface level compliance. You're going to spend a lot of time and energy on this administrative stuff to comply with the law that is completely disconnected from improving teacher effectiveness. So it's a waste of our time and energy, it's a waste of money, and it will likely have no positive impact and likely negative impacts on uh, teacher effectiveness. Uh, as clear by the lack of evidence that any of this is grounded in best practice or research. So these bills are completely disconnected from what we know to be effective in terms of teacher preparation. There are three other bills I'm just going to kind of briefly touch on. You, we can talk about this if there's time. Uh, so these don't specifically relate to the College of Education or, or universities necessarily but do impact uh, K-12 education. Uh, one has to do with an A to F school rating under the uh, Every, Stool, Every Student Succeeds Act. Each state had to come up with an accountability policy. So this is the, the new version of No Child Left Behind. Uh, currently, we have a parent dashboard which gives certain metrics on how our K-12 system is doing. This bill would then overlay this with an A to F school rating. Uh, really, in, in my view, intended to drive this continuous push for more school choice and competition among our schools, which I think is misguided. In addition, there's uh, both these sets of bills create what's known as an Education Accountability Policy Commission, which would uh, usurp a lot of the authority from the elected state school board. Uh, and this is not clear from, at least from what I read, whether or not this is uh, legal, if it would pass um, a, a challenge to the uh, Michigan Constitution. Uh, so it could be um, a, a legal quagmire that would take a lot of time and energy to, to get through. Um, the, the second set of bills would create what are known as innovative districts or schools. So this would disconnect these schools that have been approved from uh, seat time requirements or days, number of days that students meet requirements uh, based on competency-based instruction. So if uh, students demonstrate certain competencies, they can be granted credit rather than um, they've been in a, a seat full-time equivalency for uh, whatever length of time. We have 180 days here in Michigan. Um, and it really echoes, and this is right in the, the language of the bill itself, anytime, any place, anywhere, any way, any pace. Uh, it's seen largely as a, a shift of public, public money into the private sector, so the money follows the students to uh, a great deal more than it currently does, and could possibly be a way for more money to flow to private entities. Um, and the, the structure of how this would be done in terms of accountability is really problematic because it's all based on this accountability policy commission, which is largely appointed by the governor and the legislative uh, chairs. Um, and if this was to go into effect, uh, Governor Snyder would have the authority to appoint the majority of this commission, uh, and it's a four-year term, so it's another way to uh, divert power from the state school board, which is an elected body, to this appointed board. Um, one last thing that uh, most of these bills would go into effect within 90 days. So all those costs and the ability for teacher preparation programs to organize any of the requirements would be a major <coughs> challenge. So I know that was kind of a whirlwind take on whatever it was, six, seven bills. <laughs> Uh, but I'm happy to answer questions now or later, however, later. So. Um, and as someone who is elected to the State Board of Education, um, my opinion about some of those bills is it's really just to um, uh, make it easier for cyber schools, which are incredibly <coughs> profitable, 
um, because they are held to the seat time waiver or to the how many hours and the, they're supposed to provide education. Um, and it's really to accelerate the DeVos uh, plan to privatize uh, education. And um, the A through F is they want to just call a school an F and then close it, and then the solution is to open it back up as a charter. So, so this this is all part of a plan <laughs> to um, to attack public education as we know it. So anyway, that said, um, I want to call Julie Rowe. Julie Rowe works as um, to advance progressive public education and working families policies as the legislative mobilization coordinator at AFT Michigan. She organizes members to engage in policy advocacy on behalf of Michigan students, education professionals, and working families. Um, more recently, she serves as the director of the uh, One Campaign for Michigan, did an awesome job, and has worked as a regional uh, field director for the Get Out the Vote director and the Get Out the Vote director for the Michigan AFL's electoral programs to elect candidates who champion the issues of working families. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, thank you so much for having me um, here today. Um, as you know, I'm going to kind of be safe from that light. There we go. Um, uh, and thank you, Michelle, and happy birthday. Um, <laughs> thank you, Ben, for putting together a beautiful overview of the education things that are pending. Um, I do want to just add one thing to that that I think is really important, both this Public Innovation Districts Bill <laughs> and this A through F letter grading bill really are not their end game, um, right? Like the, it is the runaround, the elected State Board of Education, and it is the runaround of um, incoming Governor Whitmer um, that is their, their real goal here. Um, and then when I'll say that, it's getting very much lost in the shuffle, right? Because, um, you know, even as you go through like the intricacies of the bills that have to do with um, the teacher preparation um, and teacher colleges, um, as educators, we all spend a lot of time looking at the specifics and looking at the policy and looking at, you know, this issue or that issue, rather than, like, what is the broader picture here? Um, and it is not until lame duck that they get so overt with the broader picture sometimes that we realize it. And I'll be honest with you, when I first read the A through F legislation last year, the, uh, I looked at it as, this is raising the stakes of standardized testing. That has always been a goal. Um, this is about um, marginalizing public schools, right? This is about elevating cyber schools and charter schools as the solution to all of our problems and our big education problem, which is, in my view, also overinflated. Um, Education isn't the po problem, poverty is the problem, and no one wants to have that conversation. Um, so, but in Lame Duck, they're out of time, and they feel like the microscope isn't on them. Um, so all of this other stuff happens. Um, and not only that, but I, I actually kind of take issue with the fact that we consider this two-week period the only Lame Duck period, because with term limits, we have had ducks that are lame for years making decisions, right? You have state senators who have turned out in the House and now they're in their last term in the Senate. So for four years, they have known that they have no accountability to the voters, right? You have state House members who are termed out of the House and they were termed out, they entered their last term two years ago and they've been termed out for two years. So these last few weeks, this is more about manufactured chaos and urgency than anything else. It is a complete farce and it makes our democracy, I think, a joke to so many people. Um, so Republicans had a rough election night, election season, and, and they're going to have a rough couple of years because they've gotten very used to total and complete control. You had a Republican House, you had a Republican Senate, you had a Republican Governor, and you had a Republican Supreme Court. Of course, the legislature being one of those three, you know, it's a, but it's really it's a four-pronged four, four -pronged approach. Um, and the State Board of Education was four to four, right? It was an even split, which provided its own delight, I'm sure, Michelle. Um, and now you were looking at going into a legislative session where we, we have a goalie in the net is the way that I refer to having won the governorship but not the state senator of the state house. Um, we have someone who can veto bad legislation, who can use the veto threat on 
even not bad legislation, but things Republicans want as a way to advance <coughs> pro-public education, pro-working families legislation. Um, but that said, it's not like we can go from what the Republicans did to us for the past six, eight years, really, and go to doing it in the opposite direction and actually advancing things. They had complete and total control. They had to agree with each other. And now we're at a point where, buckle up, guys, we've got gridlock on our way, right? Um, does anyone remember with Governor Granholm's um, budgets? And it was October, and there was potentially, and in some cases, government shut down because we couldn't fund things. That's what we are moving back to. Now, the next two weeks, though, um, some of the threats that are facing us are threats that we face for a long time. So I've spoken, I think, before different individuals, but many of you are, are faces that I rec re recognize in previous legislative cycles or in the wonderful times you've invited me to speak before about these threats to labor. So um, let's, I'm going to start there uh, with union recertification. Who's heard of this? Excellent. Okay, so um, again, with we fall into this trap of wanting to be very precise and specific with our language, but all the polling tells us we have to talk about it differently. This is a union decertification bill. This is what they did in Wisconsin. It wasn't just right to work, it's that one-two punch of, yes, we don't, you know, you're right to work, you can choose not to pay your dues, and then the contract still exists, and the union still has to defend you, um, et cetera. This is, let's take a vote every two years on whether or not the union should remain. And what's, what's particularly sinister about this legislation is that it requires 50% of the bargaining unit, meaning 50% of the people who are represented by the union, not what, whether they're members, whether, whatever, to vote. If we applied that same standard to the state of Michigan's legislature, even to the governor's office, 50% of all of those have to vote for you in order to be the state rep or the state senator, we would have an empty Capitol building, and I'm, I'm struggling to see that as a bad thing right now, but, um, you know, like requiring that level of participation. I do have different feelings on whether or not voting should be compulsory or a thing that we all do, but it, it's, it's pretty much designed for unions to be eliminated. If you don't get 50% of all the people who could possibly vote for or against a union, by not voting, you are voting against a union, essentially. And let's talk about when they scheduled these elections to take place. Is that live streaming? No. No? no? Okay, it's just for us. Fun. All right, then I'm going to be very <laughs> candid. Um, <laughs> more so than usual. Um, it requires these elections to take place between August 1st and November 30th of even numbered years. Can anyone think of anything that happens between August 1st and November 30th of even numbered years? Election season. Primary and general elections. Now, this is what I didn't want to say in the camera. They are wrong in thinking that that's going to make those elections harder for us. Our members actually are more engaged and more active and more pro-union during election season. Right? They talk to us more, they see more, the issues are there, we talk to them a little bit more and we're advancing our interests. Um, we haven't done the internal polling yet, but every year, like, union approval rating sh shoots through the roof.